All right. So uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Ankit Shah, uh, and I lead the product marketing team at ECA. Uh, today, I'm super excited to welcome you all at the Ask Me Anything session for the EHG and sustainability programs. Before we start the session, a few housekeeping rules. The duration of the Ask Me Anything session will be around 30 minutes. So I request all the audience to uh, drop their questions in the Q&A section that you can see on your screen. In case you have any specific question for our panelists, you can just uh, raise your hand and uh, I can ask the admin to unmute you and then you can talk to our panelists. We shall be uh, recording the session, so you need not take any notes for this. The recording shall be shared with all the registrants after the webinar, after the session. So uh, let me introduce you to the panelists for the session. Our first panelist is Shuchi Nichawan. Uh, Shuchi is one of India's most accomplished multidisciplinary executives leading the global sustainability and the human resources function at ECA. She has been a driving force in steering companies' efforts to deliver the best in-class solutions. Shuchi was also responsible for launching the world's first blockchain-based coffee marketplace. She has been working with ECA for around 12 years now and is committed to help companies achieve greener and more sustainable initiatives. Our next panelist is Vasudev Athalai. Vasudev is the Associate, Di Associate Director for uh, Sustainability Solution at ECA. He has over 15 years of experience in environmental management, climate change, environmental compliance, audits, and due diligence. Vasudev is a certified GRI, ex GRI expert and has also extensive experience in GHG inventories and carbon, carbon critical designs. So with that, I shall hand it over to Shuchi and Vasudev. Hi Shuchi, hi Vasudev, uh, welcome to the session. Hi Ankit, hi Vasudev, hi everyone else. Uh, welcome to the session today. Happy to have your questions. Please feel free to raise your hands or drop your questions in the chat box. I think some of the questions have already also been shared with the moderators before organizing the webinar. So we'd be happy to take those questions as well, but happy to take your questions. I see one coming up. Um, yeah, so we have one question that's coming up, which is, is purchasing carbon credits a right way of saving the environment? Since the focus is not on reducing carbon emissions? That's a great question. What do you want to talk about that, Vasudev? I know that you and I have had extensive discussions on just this topic a few days back, so it would be great for you to throw some light on this. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, Ankit, and thanks, Suchi, for that question. Uh, so basically, carbon credits, uh, as we know, we are not uh, directly implementing that project, but for many companies, uh, implementing the projects is not economically viable when they want to say reduce their carbon emissions in the short term so in those cases companies try to go ahead with the purchase of carbon credits uh, but then in our view uh, and many of the environmentalists feel that it can be considered as a license to pollute or you can say in simple words it is greenwashing so in order to reduce the, that say, image that people have about carbon credits. So we feel that and we suggest that you go for like-to-like -like projects. So when I say like-to-like, -like, uh, it means we have to say, if you want to reduce GHG emissions, then you go for a project uh, that is reducing emissions in that particular category. So don't just look out for simple projects which are uh, reducing emission by planting trees. So first, we have to focus on reducing our emissions by implementing different uh, uh, strategies. Like you have to in-house, uh, say, reduce emissions, uh, then reduce your uh, fossil fuel usage, uh, bring operational efficiencies into your processes. And then if you have leftover emissions, then you should think of, uh, say, carbon offsetting uh, strategies and purchasing carbon credits. With that, I think, uh, if you want to reduce, say, fossil fuel emissions based uh, projects, then you have to go for projects uh, which are bringing carbon credits from these kind of projects only. So don't uh, go for mismatching projects. So that is what uh, we would suggest. Uh, do you have anything to add, Suchit? Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's that's great that you said yeah. that. In fact, uh, very interesting. I was having a conversation with a fellow colleague from the sustainability industry the other day, and um, she was talking about how in Indonesia, the country itself has now banned the purchase of carbon credits just to evade or just to not allow the organizations to go for greenwashing or to allow them to continue greenwashing, uh, right? So countries also play a very important role in possibly prohibiting the uh, possible purchase. The other way to do this is organizations, and we know that China specifically is levying a huge carbon tax. We also hear that's possibly happening in the um, Indian context and some other organizations and some other countries are also levying a huge carbon tax just to make sure that the organizations do not uh, go for the easy route of carbon credits purchase or carbon offsetting uh, mechanism, etc. Right. So I think that's what I would uh, add to this, that both countries and organizations have a lot of synergy and play together in, in this uh, intervention. Yeah. And I think last point uh, that I might uh, add to that is maybe after that COP26 and maybe once the Article 6 gets finalized, even the countries uh, may have to fulfill their requirements uh, on their own and then they can allow their carbon credits to be sold to outside markets. So that would be one more restriction that uh, companies may have because unless countries fulfill their own uh, nationally determined uh, targets, they won't be able to sell those in the outside markets, which was easy earlier. Right. Yeah. And so to, to Adrian's, uh, I think to Adrian's question, so well, is it the right way to purchase carbon credits? Of course not. But in the event that you've already done the damage that you have for lack of better words, then uh, at least being able to purchase those carbon credits and to have a carbon offsetting strategy to begin with could be a right way to further salvage the situation for your carbon net zero goals. I see a lot of flurry of questions, so possibly taking the next one. Um, uh, Kim says, uh, we are a food manufacturing company and our data is spread across warehouse and plants, mostly in Excel sheets. Currently, we comply with GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative Standards, and we are looking for SBTI and CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project Guidelines. How can um, you help us? Vasudev, let me take that one. Yeah. Um, so, of course, uh, Kim, that's where our strength lies in, right? Our sustainability reporting and ESG solution is framework agnostic, be it GRI, CDP, SASB, TCFD. So it's highly flexible and configurable, which means that we can enable the capturing of your data on our platform in a standardized manner across all different types of reporting frameworks um, and can map it to these frameworks in a standard templatized way. So we have a proprietary template that is used to collect um, sustainability data that's also used to guide organizations in what are the best practices of collecting data for your GRI reporting, for your uh, CDP reporting and guidelines, and also to help you frame your um, SBTI goals specifically. And of course, we have uh, in-house GRI certified experts like Vasudev here. We have a few on his team who understand your requirements and can assist in meeting your uh, framework mapping requirements as well. So a highly configurable system that is framework agnostic and can help you uh, diagnose the issues in your supply chain for sustainability, as well as help you map uh, all your E, S, and G goals and metrics to uh, the frameworks that you'd like to report on. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Kim. Uh, Ryan, um, do you want to understand how do you facilitate carbon trading? Do you want to talk about that, uh, Vasu? Uh, yeah. Uh, so in terms of carbon trading, although we do not directly get involved into that activity, uh, but then indirectly how we support our clients is uh, our platform is built 
in such a way that we can help uh, our clients to make informed decision based on different uh, carbon offsetting strategies that uh, we can build using our platform. So, for example, uh, uh, we can get uh, the readily available or publicly available information into our platform from the sources like gold standards, uh, climate registry, etc. to bring a different kind of carbon offsetting strategies. It's not just getting those strategies. Uh, some companies or your organization may have specific goal or focus area in which you want to purchase this credit. So, for example, uh, your company may have target of renewable energy uh, investment or say you want to invest in planting trees. So, we can bring, uh, bring those projects, uh, those kind of projects onto our platform and then it's not just bringing emissions uh, in these strategies. We also bring the cost in that so that you can make informed decisions by comparing uh, different carbon offsetting strategies in terms of emissions and cost both. Uh, it's not just uh, the offsetting strategies. We also bring, uh, we also have uh, ability to bring in uh, internal emissions uh, that you reduce using different projects. So, for example, if you have, say, 10% reduction um, by uh, installing a solar plant uh, uh, in your say, uh, factory or premises then we know that you have to say reduce 90 percent of your emissions by using different strategies or different uh, offset projects so that is how we built in your internal emission reduction different carbon offsetting strategies to suit your requirements and company goals and then uh, bringing you uh, the cost that these projects will uh, 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 take you uh, uh, to that particular level. So that is how I will put uh, uh, how we can help in this carbon offsetting or carbon trading. Anything sure. you want to add, Suchi? No, I think I think that's uh, yeah. captured really well in the interest of time. I'm kind of uh, looking at taking the next question from Ryan. Um, so after COP26, he asks, uh, European Union is also focusing on non-financial reporting from businesses. What should be the approach to creating a report? And what are the critical parameters to be considered in the report? Uh, let me take a stab at that first, uh, Vasudevan. You can feel free to answer that and add to it. Well, you're right um, that the European Union is focusing a lot more on non-financial reporting from businesses. And for the, re the reason for that is that um, the sustainability risk is assessed a lot of times as non-financial or non-economic risk. But this risk has the potential to become both operational risk or um, financial risk. Uh, for example, if you do not um, you know, have your right human resources or labor compliances or waste management strategies in place and you are not able to report accurately on them you default on them based on certain disclosure metrics for your industry for your country there is a high um, possibility that your operations could be shut uh, for a small amount of time and that could cause an economic loss to your organization that could be ultimately a financial risk for the organization. So you're right that non-financial reporting, non-financial risk is now coming uh, front and center for businesses. And the right way to approach in creating this report would be first to do a clear materiality analysis. And when we say materiality analysis, it is essentially what are those components, metrics, whether on the climate side, or on the waste management side, or on the influence, the ethics and compliance side, or on the product quality and safety side, you know, there are a whole lot of metrics, about 500 different metrics that can be captured across the environmental, social and governance criteria, which are those top uh, uh, categories that your organization needs to focus on, and who are the consumers of this information. That would be the two key areas for you to begin with, to say, what is my vision for the organization on sustainability that we want to report on? What would be my materiality analysis basis that? And what would be my, um, what would be the consumers or who would be the consumers of this reporting? If you have those three 
and there's an honest intention to not just do greenwashing, but look at this from a transparent disclosure perspective, I think there is a high possibility and likelihood that you will end up creating what is a profound and meaningful report and not just a report which is out there for the investors or the shareholders to just take a look at, uh, right? Because we are not here to create a report that is um, visually appealing, but not deep in terms of what it could communicate to the shareholders and stakeholders. Uh, to create a profound and meaningful report, it needs to contain all the relevant components of why are we creating this? What are the components of the materiality matrix that we have included in it? And who are we creating this report for such that we can address the concerns of that audience? Because the stakeholders have different needs from um, the report. The employees are seeking a different viewpoint from an organization while the investors are seeking a different viewpoint from the um, reporting, right? So I would say those would be key considerations for an organization when you're starting to look at creating a report. Uh, you'd want to say something or add something to this, Vasu? Uh, yeah, so I will add quickly two points. So first is like, uh, if you are like, uh, having your current reporting in terms of say any standardized framework then i think you are already set say 60 or 70 percent uh, for your next reporting uh, that the UA eu is proposing one of the important thing that uh, will come out of this is to bring consistency and standardization and another thing is auditing so when you are reporting that data auditing will come in picture so when you are bringing consistency and uh, there will be a comparability uh, of data between different organizations. So the first thing that comes in mind is digitization of your data. So you need to have uh, your data uh, on digital platforms, reporting them on digital platforms. And uh, that way you are bringing consistency and comparability to your data. And it is also uh, uh, audit proof uh, uh, in terms of future. So that is what I wanted to add. Thanks, Vasudev. Thank you. Um, possibly you can take the next question, which I see coming up. Um, we in the chemical industry, how can we benchmark ourselves based on the ESG performance? Uh, yeah. So when we are considering benchmarking, organizations generally uh, have intention of improving their performance and compare themselves against industry best practices as well as industry, say, uh, leaders in that particular segment. So first thing is, uh, when you are comparing your data, you need to have your data ready uh, for that particular disclosure or for that particular area. Then uh, second thing is, uh, it depends on how your existing resource or, say, uh, knowledge base you have within your own industry. So for example, if you have, say, uh, knowledgeable EAG team, uh, and resources within your own company, then you can definitely do this benchmarking activity on your own. Uh, but then that is limited by the uh, publicly available information uh, in the market. So if you don't have access to that kind of information, then your uh, comparison uh, gets restricted or benchmarking gets restricted. So there are different uh, rating agencies or many organizations that provide this kind of data, uh, benchmarking data in these days. So be it uh, ESG rating of different companies uh, on different parameters or be it uh, uh, other companies who are providing these data sets. So one good feature that even our platform has is we can bring in that kind of data uh, to our platform using inbuilt connectors and then uh, this uh, platform itself can help you to compare your existing parameters uh, along with uh, the industry best practices uh, as a benchmarking exercise. So that is how companies can do their benchmarking exercise. Thanks, Vasudev. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question, possibly I'll take a stab at this, is what is the implementation process and typical time required for an ESG reporting project? So Brian, there are two ways to, um, to solve this, right? For any organization. Way number one is 
when organizations typically end up doing this manually, which is collecting the data manually, um, making sure that the data is massaged, understood from a validity perspective, and then reporting it by mapping it and creating all the requisite visuals, dashboards uh, to create the finalized report for review by the stakeholders. And a typical time to do this manually uh, from collecting of the data and before that even the assessment process is between six to eight months for a mid-sized organization that has typically two to three people dedicated to this activity and has about 10 different stakeholders across human resources team, finance team, procurement, or different plant and sites and compliance teams that are helping them in creating this report uh, and managing the ESG reporting. So uh, between six to eight months for a dedicated a team of three interacting across 10 different um, support members of different groups is what we think is the ideal time that is required or that is currently uh, caught up by organizations in ESG reporting. However, if you were to do it with a software solution, um, like the one we have at ECA, we have been able to really condense this process of reporting to a six to eight weeks process uh, from start to finish uh, with visuals, with everything given in to stakeholders, a report that is meaningful, that is handed over to um, the organization in a PDF format, in a Word format, along with a multitude of insights, so close to 100 plus insights or dashboards uh, across 500 plus metrics on all three components of ESG, which is environment, social, and governance, is what we are able to manage through the intense automation and proprietary templatization of the ESG reporting process, um, I'd say. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, so, um, Wasu, um, Adrian has another question. He says, my organization is interested in reporting and forecasting. There's scope one and scope two emissions for our facilities in Australia and Europe. How do we start? So this is pertinent to scope one and scope two emissions, geographies, Australia and Europe. Uh, what would your recommendations be? Uh, yeah, so uh, Adrian, uh, when you are starting your uh, GHG inventory journey, the first step is to have say uh, robust systems and procedures in place to uh, manage the kind of huge data that we need for GHG inventorization, be it say, emission uh, factor data or be it your activity data. So in terms of scope one and scope two, when we start talking about them, so for scope one, you need to first understand uh, the emissions that uh, you are generating because of activity that are within your own control or which you are responsible uh, in terms of say finances, etc. cetera. Uh, so these are called like direct emissions and in terms of scope two, so these are kind of indirect emissions. You would be focusing on the electricity uh, that you purchase for your own uses. So emissions are not happening uh, at your facility, but then they are happening somewhere uh, because of the electricity, electricity that you are using at uh, your facility. So once we have this activity data within the boundary uh, of uh, uh, this GNG inventory, we need to link that with emission factors. So when you are saying emission factors, so these might be specific to say Australia and New Zealand, we need to bring them in uh, uh, to interact with the activity data that we already captured. And then uh, with the calculations of this activity and emission data, uh, we can bring the scope one and scope two inventory for your organization. But then this process involves a lot of data handling and there is a chance that if you are doing this uh, manually or using Excel spreadsheet, you, you have a chance of getting something wrong. Uh, so the, uh, the best thing to do is uh, you use the digital platforms like the one we have uh, to bring uh, your scope one and scope two emission inventory uh, on a digital level. 
and second thing is like these days everyone is talking about uh, uh, forecasting or uh, modeling the emissions for different scenarios because they want to know the risk and liabilities that they might have in future so that thing as a starting point uh, of your uh, future liability estimation uh, definitely helps you uh, in identifying that risk that you may have so even uh, the platform that we have uh, provides that ability uh, to forecast your future emissions uh, based on your uh, historical gag inventory so that is what i would put uh, in terms of scope one and scope two inventorization yeah. Thanks, Masu. Uh, just taking the last question, I think that's pretty much the last question that we have uh, by James. If a company is just getting started with sustainability and ESG, where and how should they start? So maybe I can uh, take this uh, concluding answer, um, Basu. So, well, we all know that what you can't manage, uh, what you can't measure, you cannot manage, right? So the sustainability and ESG reporting journey itself for organizations that are starting uh, with tracking and measuring what is important for their data needs to start from there. You need to be able to measure, you need to be able to understand what is the data that you need to start measuring and then uh, essentially bring in the different metrics and components of that data itself. So let's say scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, or rather scope one and scope two, because you're just starting out with your sustainability journey, right? You identify that climate change is important to us, carbon neutrality is important to us. So for that as an organization, what is important to you is that you start your path um, charter on the scope one and scope two emissions gathering, um, right? Data from various sources like Vasu, they've also explained in one of his previous answers. So in order for you to do that, you need to have a native understanding of what all components go into actually gathering that data. And there is a method to that madness in allowing you to capture that data. And like we've said in a couple of answers before, right? There is a tendency for organizations to go wayward and to not understand fully how to capture that data because you're just getting started with that journey, right? So it does take a bit of fine tuning to get to where you need to be. So especially for organizations that do not have the uh, company bandwidth and do not have the sustainability and ESG maturity uh, within their organizations need uh, some external help, uh, we would recommend that you start in a small way, even if it is with a small digital method or digital intervention of doing this, because this would substantially reduce the burden on yourself for educating um, this large scale change management process, because sustainability and ESG are not just, um, you know, you are not just going to uh, be able to manage what you're measuring immediately. It's a change management ideology. It's a change management thought process. So first for us to also understand the gravitas of the situation to say, how do we bring in change? Technology is a very good partner to enable that change and to help you understand what standard methodologies are out there to help you capture that data, to help you manage that data, and then to help you start um, tracking and reporting it in a systematic manner. So I'd say start even if small, but start with a digital intervention that could provide substantial help and it would solve a lot of your basic ground level issues while starting. Uh, I hope that helps. All right, we are nearing the end of our um, session today, I think we are nearly at conclusion time. Um, so if there are no questions, uh, we're happy to conclude. Uh, please feel free to reach out the team uh, to reach out to us on our um, LinkedIn handles, through our website, um, through the channels where we've also reached out to you and we'd be happy to assist you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have a great day.